Uber has placed Bo Young Lee, its head of diversity, on leave after she moderated a couple of employee events that made the <gasps> horrifying mistake of including the perspectives of white female employees. After several years of diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, making it clear that the inclusion part is really meant to exclude the you know, participation of white women. Some employees at Uber didn't take kindly to the sudden paradigm shift. Backlash from Uber workers who felt the topic was insensitive spooked the company's execs who immediately decided to place Lee on leave. Now, the future of their longtime diversity, equity, and inclusion chief is uncertain. The New York Times writes that employees' concerns centered on a pair of events that were billed as diving into the spectrum of the American white woman's experience and hearing from white women who work at Uber with a focus on the Karen persona. They were intended to be an open and honest conversation about race according to the invitation. Employees turned to the company's Slack to complain and express that they didn't like that some of their white colleagues saw Karen as a derogatory term. But as we all know, Karen absolutely is a derogatory term. Are we really gonna pretend like it's not? Employees felt the event organizers were minimizing racism and the harm white people can inflict on people of color by focusing on how Karen is a hurtful word according to messages and an employee who attended the events. Mm, well, it's a derogatory term. That's why it's used in a derogatory sense after someone is perceived to have engaged in bad behavior. Now the controversy didn't die down. Weeks later, the Karen conundrum was aired in a company wide meeting. Several weeks after the first event, a black woman asked during an Uber all hands meeting, how the company would prevent tone deaf, offensive and triggering conversations from becoming a part of its diversity initiatives. Lee replied, arguing that while the discussions can sometimes feel uncomfortable, they were important and necessary to have. Sometimes being pushed out of your own strategic ignorance is the right thing to do. That's what she said. Now, as you can imagine, that comment did not really do much to calm the situation down and instead sparked additional outrage and complaints to executives. So Lee decided to hold a second event which was intended to be a dialogue where employees could express how they felt about what they heard during the first event. But that led to even more complaints. In Slack, groups for black and Hispanic employees at Uber fumed that instead of a chance to provide feedback or have a dialogue, they were instead being lectured about their response to the initial don't call me Karen event. One person wrote, I felt like I was being scolded for the entirety of that meeting. Another employee took issue with the premise that the term Karen shouldn't be used. Look, I'm gonna be honest with you, in the workplace, you shouldn't be calling your coworkers Karens. It's just not a good idea. And by the way, just let that sink in for a moment. Employees were openly angry that they couldn't use a derogatory word against some of their colleagues. This type of work environment is just fantastic. I mean, it's not hostile at all. Now, in, in response to the apparent uproar, Uber's chief executive and chief people officer sent employees an internal email and asked Bo Young Lee to step back and take a leave of absence while they determine next steps. The email also let employees know that, quote, we have heard that many of you are in pain and upset by yesterday's moving forward session. While it was meant to be a dialogue, it's obvious that those who attended did not feel heard. Look, I gotta be honest, simply treating employees equally and providing a space for some to gently push back on the Karen narrative is nothing compared to the several years people have been consuming speeches like the one Dr. Aruna Kilanani gave at Yale in 2022. Yeah, 
I just want to reiterate what you heard there. The audio wasn't great, so just in case you didn't hear it. During a speech at Yale in April of 2022, Dr. Aruna Kilanani said, and I quote, I had fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person that got in my way, burying their body and and wiping my bloody hands as I walked away relatively guiltless with a bounce in my step. Like I did the world an effing favor. Okay, now that might seem like a bizarre isolated incident. And to be honest, the rhetoric there is is rare. I haven't heard rhetoric that extreme. But there is an entire industry where authors and academics make a killing conducting trainings that simply tell white workers to shut their mouths and take kindly to hours of being told they're all the same. They're all racist, they're all hateful, they all deserve what's coming to them. And it should come to no surprise that DEI trainings like this have led to lawsuits because they include, you know, discrimination. In 2020, at least half a dozen people who had been employed by the New York City Department of Education filed lawsuits or won settlements in cases relating to mandatory DEI trainings. What I'm also not surprised about is how lucrative this industry is. After George Floyd's murder, as companies faced pressure to demonstrate a commitment to racial justice, interest in diversity, equity and inclusion exploded. The American market reached an estimated $3.4 billion in 2020 alone. Take Syra Rao and Regina Jackson as just one example. They run a business called Race to Dinner and wealthy white women across the country pay them handsomely to come to their dinner parties to bash the host and her white friends as racists. They do this without knowing anything about the dinner guests, without ever having interacted with them. All they know about these individuals is the color of their skin and automatically they assume these white women have anti black prejudice in their hearts. How much do they charge? Well, if you ask me a lot, each dinner party initially cost $2,500 total, but the rate increased to $5,000 in 2020. Gee, I wonder why. The funds cover a two hour dinner, which includes support from Race to Dinner's business developer, planning, travel for Jackson and Rao, and when applicable, a post event consultation. The cost of food was not included in the original dinner party fee. This is the perfect example of a DEI related grift that allows economically privileged women to engage in performative acts to feel like they're doing their part to fight racism. Of course, they're not actually doing anything to fight racism at all. And if they want to pay for that, great. But the race to dinner ladies have also published books and even put out a movie called Deconstructing Karen. As a result, their simplified portrayal of white women seeps into the public consciousness and discourse. Their words, as void of evidence as they may be, are treated as fact. But don't worry, they also think immigrants to America are automatically anti-black racists as well. Syra will generally say that she is anti-black and everybody will pivot towards me. And I go, well, and black people know it. The uh. gig is up. We know that you, every person who comes to this country as an immigrant, believes themselves to be better than us. Based on what? What evidence is there that immigrants come into the country and automatically see themselves as higher up the food chain or the hierarchy than black people? There's no evidence of that. Look, I think this discourse has had a devastating impact on the country. Because when you mix business interests with the branding of social justice, chances are the objective is really about profit rather than actually addressing systemic issues. And if the main problem is systemic racism, why are we all engaging in this toxic witch hunt? Sussing out people we perceive to be problematic does nothing to address racism in our criminal justice system. It does nothing to improve educational curriculum in our schools. And it fails to ensure that people of color have equal opportunities to wealthier white people. We've been conditioned to think that generalizations about entire groups of people is somehow okay, as if it doesn't contradict the fight against racism. We've taken the bait in this extremely successful divide and conquer strategy, and to be honest, I've been struck by how effortlessly callous 
the online discourse has become. Any out of context viral video that features a conflict with a white woman is automatically considered evidence of a racist act, even before we have all the details. The latest example involved a pregnant hospital worker named Sarah Comrie in New York. She was captured on video during an argument she had with a black man over a city bike in Manhattan. The man claimed that he paid for the bike rental, but Comrie disagreed. No, no, record him, record him, record him, record him. The dominant online narrative was that this racist pregnant woman tried to steal a bike from a black man and then made herself out to be a victim with her white tears. Her attorney later provided receipts claiming that she in fact paid for the bike. But it felt like no one thought it might be a good idea to just wait and see what the truth was before attacking her. Her employer at Bellevue Hospital was immediately contacted. She was placed on leave pending an investigation. Now her attorney is looking to potentially sue media outlets that propagated false allegations about his client. But we still don't know the full story. And it's better to wait and see how this develops before people try to destroy a stranger's life and livelihood. So do we feel better about racism in America today? It certainly feels like we're becoming more divided. We're definitely more obsessed with whipping out our phones to surveil one another because God forbid we fail to capture one of our peers in their worst moments. Simply put, I absolutely loathe this crap. And I can't pretend like I'm above it because I engaged in a lot of it myself. And I have deep regrets about that. Karen hunting is a destructive symptom of the powerlessness people feel as they're more atomized and alienated from those around them. It's the abscess that forms from the lack of an organized movement that values the humanity of individuals while fighting institutions that propagate inequality. It's what happens when society fails to understand the critical nature of solidarity in fighting systems of oppression. The Karen narrative flattens an entire category of people, white women, as malignant members of society whose toxicity lay dormant until they're in the presence of people of color. It's ridiculous. But back to DEI trainings, is there any evidence that they even work? Well, over the years, social scientists who have conducted careful reviews of the evidence base for diversity training have frequently come to discouraging conclusions. Though diversity training workshops have been around in one form or another since at least the 1960s, few of them are ever subjected to rigorous evaluation. And those that are mostly appear to have little or no positive long term effects. The lack of evidence is disappointing, wrote Elizabeth Levy Palick of Princeton and her co-authors in a 2021 annual review of psychology article considering the frequency with which calls for diversity training emerge in the wake of widely publicized instances of discriminatory conduct. In fact, there are unfortunately even some studies that indicate these trainings could be causing more harm than good. I mean, certainly if you're being told by your colleagues that you're automatically a bad person and you're very likely racist because of the color of your skin, gonna cause some hostility in the workplace, no? Now in the case of DEI, Dr. Dobbin and Dr. Kalev warn that diversity training that is mandatory or that threatens dominant group sense of belonging or makes them feel blamed may elicit negative backlash or exacerbate biases, yeah. I mean, no surprise there. So if employers insist on DEI trainings, they shouldn't shun discussions that are actually inclusive. But personally, I'd rather encourage employees to go out and grab a drink together after work. They should bond and get to know each other without a third party mediator making money off of their interactions. And employees should understand that any effort to improve their working conditions and to do something about actual systemic racism as a whole is reliant on solidarity with their fellow coworkers. Despite pr the protests, I think Uber's diversity chief had the right idea. If you're going to implement diversity, equity and inclusion trainings at the workplace, they should be inclusive of everyone's thoughts, feelings and participation. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. 
you'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.